Well, it's Friday night, and that means it's Friday night Photoshop. Tonight we're talking about Adobe Bridge. This is a free program that Adobe offers. You don't even have to be a subscriber of Photoshop or Lightroom. You can download this, and it's totally free. And this is a program that is good for uh, managing your assets and also browsing your media. And I'll be showing you how that all works tonight. But first, just a shameless plug, as I like to say, if you've got slides that you're looking to get transferred, I transfer slides. So uh, give me a call or reach out to me via email, and I'll be happy to uh, talk to you more about that. So you're looking at Adobe Bridge right now. What this is, is a, as I mentioned earlier, it's really a media browser. And this shows you what you have on your hard drive. There's a little bit of a myth about storage of photos. You don't store images in Bridge. You don't store images in Photoshop or in Lightroom. You store them on your hard drive. This is just a means to go and view what is on your hard drive. So if we look at this display, first thing I'm going to take you to is right over here on the left. And if I go to this PC, this is going to show all the different devices that I've got, all the logical devices, if you will. So like here's my C drive. We never want to store images to the C drive. The only thing that should be there is applications and Windows or your operating system. Then I've got other drives here, like th this is actually a Blu-ray drive. But then I've got this uh, H drive, which is actually a memory card, a CF card. And then I've got this K drive. Well, the K drive is where I store all of my images. And if I click on the K drive and just open this up, this is how I store them. This goes all the way back to 2002. And the nice thing about this is I've got these all stored by date. And I can go into the most recent one that I've done, which would be 2022. 11 and when i open this up this is showing me all the pictures that i've taken this month and that i've put into this particular folder now when i put images into the folder i just use windows uh, file explorer and now if you have uh, a mac then there's probably uh, some program that you'd have where you can go and, and simply copy all your files all your content into a folder that you would generate and what I do is I'll even create subfolders under this. So like here, my folder is 2022-11. And in this, I've got the Moon Eclipse folder. And then I've got my Gardens Aglow. And I'll work with some of these images tonight so you can see what that looks like. And then I've just got some other images that I've taken around. And these are just some shots that I've done this month. Now, I can navigate around this so quickly. I'm just using the thumb wheel on my mouse just to page up, page down to look around. And just like when you go into a grocery store and you walk down the canned goods aisle, if you see a can of soup that you want, you simply reach your hand out, take that can of soup in your hands, take it right off the shelf and put it into your basket. This is the way I like to describe Bridge. It's not an inventory program. This isn't a database. What this is doing is it's showing you what you have. So if I come over here and click on this leaf, for instance, if I double click on this, it will spawn Adobe Camera Raw because I know this is a CR2 file, which is a Camera Raw file. And I know that I have this file. It's not like it's in inventory. And if I click on it, I get a file not found. That doesn't happen with Bridge. I hear a lot of people who have that issue with Lightroom. and that's what I like most about Bridge, is because what you see is what you get. And there's no wondering about does this file actually exist. So let's just double click on this for a moment and I'll come back and I'll show you around Bridge, but I just wanna show you how this works. So I've just double clicked on this file and because it's a raw file, see it's spawning Adobe Camera Raw. And that's what I wanted to do. And over here, I could go ahead and do some adjustments and do uh, whatever uh, I feel I might want to do to this. And then I would go ahead and open it. And when I open this, now this will bring that edited file into Photoshop. 
Boom. It's that simple. Now, if you've been going to open your files by in Photoshop, going up to File and then Open, yeah, you can do that too, but it's not as visual, and to me, it's not as easy. I really like, I'm not going to bother saving this, I just like the ability to go into Bridge and just look around, and if I want to look at any one of these closer, all I have to do is click on it, and this shows me a nice preview. And by the way, if you hit spacebar, it brings it up full screen. And, but wait, there's more. If I simply click on this with the mouse, it's going to zoom in really tight, and I can look around and see this image. And then click again, and it brings me right back out to see the full image. And when I hit spacebar, this is like a light table, isn't it? Now we can do some customization in Bridge. For instance, if these thumbnails are too small for you, there's this little slider down here, which hopefully you can see on your screen. And if I move this over to the plus, I can make these much bigger. Or I can move this over to the minus and make them much smaller. So depending upon your needs and how big your screen is, you would want to adjust that to your liking. Let's look around the interface just a little bit more. Up here, I've got my favorites. These are all folders that I frequently go to. And so if I wanted to put a image, uh, put a folder into the favorites, for instance, here's my Gardens Aglow. If I just take this and drag it over here, now that's in my favorites. Now I don't have to remember to go to the K drive to the 2022 11 Gardens Aglow. If I just simply click on this, it takes me right there. So this is a great way to be able to organize your images and make collections, if you will, uh, to be able to uh, quickly get around to see things. Now, if I wanted to go look at last month, I happen to have the uh, 2022 10, and so these are all the images that I took last month. And then in here, I've got separate folders. And I've got images I took in Booth Bay Harbor. I took some pictures of an Honor Flight uh, recipient who came back to Maine. A uh, Halloween party that I attended. And then these are just some random shots that I did uh, out, in the, out in the field, out and about. Again, if I don't want this to be in my favorites, all I have to do is right-click in this. And I can just remove it from the favorites, and there it's gone. But if I want to put it back there, well, I can do that pretty easily. So these are just favorites. And again, these are ones that I go to frequently. You don't have to put images or folders into the favorites. But if you're going to be working on a project, you're going to want to put that project into a folder anyway. And if you're working on a couple different projects, Instead of having to go and navigate all around your hard drive to try and find these, why not just move them over, uh, just copy them over here to the favorites? And that will give you the ability to quickly get to these files. So I mentioned how I was taking some pictures at Gardens Aglow, and I've already done some editing to these files. If I move this next box up down below, this gives me the ability to look at how I have filtered these files. Filtered meaning a number of different ways. I can turn on a filter to show me just the raw files. Or I could look at just the MP4 files, which are all the video files. Or I could look at just the Photoshop files that I've done. I even have uh, a pictures to exe file because I created a video to uh, get some of the uh, the videos off for, for news. So let's see how this works. If I click on the camera raw images, well, that's all I'm going to see up here. And as I scroll down, these are all just raw files. If I go and look at the MP4 files, these are all videos. And as I click on these, I can roll the uh, the video and actually watch the video play there's not a whole lot happening in that scene, but let's bring this one up. And you'll see these people walking through. So this is a great way to preview videos that you've shot on your camera. Oh, and you can hear it too. I don't know if you can hear the audio in there, but 
Okay, I'm just going to pause that. But you can see this is a great media browser. So we can go and look at these files. Here are the Photoshop documents that I created. And if I click on one, that's one that I uh, created by using HDR. It took seven shots to make that one image. Here are the DNG images that I had made. And again, these are what you get when you do a bunch of HDR shots. I'll be doing a lot about HDR when I talk about Adobe Camera Raw. That will be a whole nother night. But you can see how I can filter these very quickly. And that's really nice. And the back of your camera, you might have a button that says rating. When you're in the field, if you take a shot that you really like, you can poke that rating button. And this will give you the ability to sort based upon the rating of one to five stars. And I use this all the time when I'm doing headshots because I'll always have the client come back and look at the back of my camera and they'll look at the 10 or 12 images that I've taken and then they'll say, that's the one I like right there. Okay, I just go and hit the rate button and then when I open up these files, I can get to that, that star real quick. You can rate after the fact too. It doesn't have to be done in camera. Let me show you some other filters that we can do here, which is kind of interesting. We can look at the date that the images were created. We can look at the original timestamp, which could be of importance. Orientation, here's all the landscape images versus here's all the portrait images. If you're doing a magazine cover, wouldn't it be nice just to instantly go and say, well, let's go look at all the ones that would fit a magazine cover before I'd have to go in and do something tricky like content aware resizing to take a landscape image and make it portrait. Aspect ratio, well, I do have one that I edited to a 16 by nine for TV purposes. And there it is, that's a 16 by nine. Otherwise the camera shoots natively in two to three aspect ratio. Uh, there's color profile. These are all mostly going to be Adobe RGB or untagged. That would be straight out of the camera. Color mode, RGB for the most part. Huh, no color mode. That's, uh, oh, because these are videos. That's right. Uh, they don't take a, a color mode setting. Bit depth, ISO speed ratings. Here's a good one. Here's every picture I shot at ISO 640. Here's every picture I took at ISO 500. You could sort by ISO if you're so inclined. How about sorting by exposure time? Uh, the shortest shot that I did was a 1 80th of a second. And that would be it right there. And of course, it's pretty dark. This would be the longest one that I did, which was at two seconds. And I can look at other exposure times throughout my whole photo shoot there. Aperture value. I took 27 images at f2.8. Well, you can see these are some of the brighter ones that I, uh, that I had to make. Now, what did I make when I closed this down to f10? Oh, I only did one there. And I did this one just to get the lights to be a whole lot sharper. That's actually at f11. Here's one at f10. Oh, the moose in the water. <laughs> I can look at focal length. You see, this goes on and on and on, but I'll just do this real quick. Focal length, here's uh, the widest angle shots that I took at, 15, at 16 millimeter. And then the most telephoto I did was this one at 95 millimeter to be able to get that shot looking across the lake. This will even tell me what lenses I used. This is wonderful to be able to pull up and, and look at especially if you should be renting a lens or if you borrow a lens from somebody, you go out on a photo shoot and you're looking at an image and you say, gee, I wonder what lens that was shot with. Well, you can just go in and sort by it. Here's every picture I took with a 16 to 35 millimeter f2.8 lens. It's a great nighttime shooting lens and it does a really nice job to uh, shoot dark scenes. Now, here's what I have is my walk around lens. I didn't do that many because it's not a fast lens. It's only an F4. 
Would you believe I can even pull open and look at the model of the camera that this was shot with? And here's the serial number of the camera. And here's the white balance that was used uh, as shot in custom. And then finally, camera raw. These are uh, uh, images that were cropped from camera raw. Here are the ones that are uncropped. And then here are the ones that are cropped. And then I've got custom settings and so forth. So you can do a lot down here to find information about the image. And it's easy to go and click on. It's also easy to get a little bit confused because if I were to come in here and click on DNG images, and if you didn't know that filter was enabled, you might look and say, where'd all my pictures go? <laughs> Yeah, you know, maybe if you accidentally came down here and clicked on the aspect ratio and you said, okay, 16 by 9, and you're saying, wait, I'm looking at Gardens of Globe, but there's no pictures. Well, it's because this is sorting and it's culling out what is not in the selection. So let's move on. I think the next part I would like to talk about is some of the information that we see over on the right-hand side of the screen. And I'm going to move this up so that we can see some more data that gets collected every time you take a picture. So I'm looking at this image and that I've just chosen. And immediately we can see that this was shot at f2.8 at a 20th of a second. And I underexposed this by one stop because uh, I wanted the colors. If I had done this at what the camera thought it should be at, this is all going to be blown out and you're not going to get the colors. And I'm at ISO 500. Typically, you go with a lower ISO when you're shooting a source of light at night. But because there are people in here, I wanted to be able to take a picture a little bit faster to stop the motion of them walking. Now, a 20th isn't really that great, but thankfully they're far enough away that if there's a little bit of blurry, it's not going to be, uh, not going to be that bad. This is telling me how big the file is natively, 32.87 megs. It's a raw file naturally, so it's gonna be big. And this just tells me what the pixel dimensions are for this image. Now, we've got these file properties that I can come down and take a look at. And now a lot of this we've already seen, but if I come down here and do the IPTC core, huh, my name is in there as the creator of this. Well, that's because in the camera, you can go into the menu and in one of the submenus, you can go and enter your name and you can also put in your email address. So every time you take a picture, this gets put into the metadata automatically. And I highly recommend anybody with a new camera go and do this because if your camera's ever stolen or lost, well, here's a great way to get it back because you can find this information. Now, I can add a whole bunch of information. This is all about me, the creator. I could put in the fact that I'm from Yarmouth, Maine. I could put in my zip code. I could put in my phone number, what country I'm in. I could fill this all up if I were so inclined. And by the way, I can do this for all of these images all at once. I can do it as a batch. I'll show you how that's done here in a moment. I just want to walk you through what these can do. This is really important if you're ever going to take your images and send them off to a stock photography house because all this goes with the image. Unlike Lightroom, where that creates a separate folder and you would send your images, then you'd have to send that catalog. You don't want to do that. If you attach it to the image itself, when the uh, editor or whomever is looking at the image pulls that image up, they'll immediately see all this information if they go look for it naturally. And it's all tied right into the file, right into the image. And it, by the way, it works with JPEGs as well. So it's not just raw files. So if I skip on down here, headline for this and garden and, and uh, description, I'm going to call this Gardens the Globe because that's what it is. D-E-N-A-G-L-O-W. So Gardens the Globe. Uh, headline, I could... Uh, call lights and call it whatever. All right. Now we can come up with keywords here. And again, we could do uh, um, 
A-R-D-E-N, garden, comma, uh, light, comma, night, comma, color. Whatever keyword meets the need for this image, all right? And if I just click away, it's going to say, do you want to apply these? And I'm going to say yes. That's all attached to this file right now. That's how easy it was. See, if I click on this one, it's not there. But when I click here, it is. Let me just keep going, going down. The date created and the time. This is why it's important to set your clock in your camera. Try and get it really accurate if you can. That can be good. Here, the city, well, I could say where this was shot. And Maine. And I can go in here, copyright notice. Copyright status, well, I'd like to make that copywritten. I'm going to say apply to that. Let me do that again. Copyrighted. That's what I wanted right there. All right. And you can even put in rights usage terms. If you had something special, only for down east use, only for Yankee, only for educational purposes, only for, you know, whatever, whatever criteria you want to put in. So... And I'm not going to fill all this out tonight, <laughs> but I'm just showing you how it's there. The uh, IPTC extension is more information that you can choose to put in. A lot of this isn't going to be pertinent to you unless you're doing pictures of people in that. Like here's models, the age of the model, uh, the release status, that kind of information. Is it a, uh, who's the, um, the type of source? What's the values here? original or digitized from film, created by software. There's just a lot of information. Photoshop caters to so many different industries, and it's not just for photographers. Now, here's the camera metadata. All this is collected just by pushing the button. It tells me the focal length of the lens. This is at 17 millimeter. It's a 16 to 35. This lens uh, was at f2.8. And then I can come down here and uh, tell you that here's the, the lens. It's funny, this lens serial number doesn't show up on this one, but sometimes it does. The, uh, here's the camera that was used, the uh, serial number of the camera, uh, the lens specification, all this information. White balance, it was set to manual. That's how I can tell you if you're shooting an auto, by the way. <laughs> uh, I did not have my GPS on in the camera. But if I did, this would give me a latitude and longitude. If you need to know the precise location of where you're taking the picture, well, so you enable that in your camera, and this is where it shows up. Camera raw, well, this gives the information uh, about all the settings that were adjusted when I set this up over in camera raw. There is no audio to this, so this will even track... Look at this. Artist, album, genre, composer. Yeah, if you had audio files, you could actually go and enter this information, even right down to the engineer of whoever it was that uh, did the uh, recording mix. Or for video, here's the, uh, the date, the scene, uh, the tape name, which these days they don't really use tape, but at one point that was a big deal. You had to know which tape you were working with. And then Diacom. Well, this is something that maybe somebody, I'd be curious to know if anybody on the channel would be even familiar with this, but this is really medical records. Yeah, Adobe Photoshop and Bridge can be used for, oh, think of uh, medical imaging, you know, x-rays, sonograms, things like that. And this is where you'd be putting in you know, the patient's date of birth, the patient ID, the name, and so forth. There's so much in this that we just do not use. So we don't have to use it. I'm just showing you that it's there. So what I'd like to show now is how we can batch this. So if I come over here and do a control A, this is gonna select all of these images. Now, I can come in to the metadata information here and put in information that will be pertinent to all of these. So for instance, let's just come down here to the city and I'm gonna put in Booth Bay because they're all done in Booth Bay. These are all done in Maine. 
And I can go with USA. Now, if I click away, I do get this box that says, metadata changes are in progress. Do you want to apply these? Yes, I do. But I can also say, don't show me this box again. So what I've just done is now, if I click on one of these, you see, Booth Bay, Maine, USA. If I go click on the one up top, same thing. By the way, I'm going to do a control A for all. And now I'm going to change this copyright status to, to copyrighted. And now if I click away, then go click on one. There it is. It took a little moment for it to get updated, but there it is. So if I wanted to add a specific keyword to just this image, this image, and let's say this image, I've just control clicked on those images. And over under keywords, I might say moose, because that's a lighted moose. <laughs> and now if I look at this one, you won't see moose there, but if I look at this one, you will. Now here's something else that we can do. Let's say I open up this folder and I want to go see the moose. Where is it? If I do a control F for find, first of all, I'm going to look in this folder. I'm going to look under keywords, although I could look at it under any of these modes. I could sort by whatever, right down to the focal length, the lens and everything. But in this case, keywords has to contain, I'm going to say moose. And I'm going to say include all the subfolders and non-index files. Okay. And boom, look at that. It just found these. And this is the moose. And it's because I put that keyword in here. Let's just do that one more time. So with the moose that I have, let's just do this. Control F and moose, find. All right. So I'm going to take this one. And if I open this now, now it's a raw file, so this is going to spawn Adobe Camera Raw. So we know that. And I'm just going to do minimal adjustments to this because we'll do a whole lot more on Adobe Camera Raw on another night. But I'm going to say open this image. And this is going to bring it into Photoshop. And now if I go up to File and look at the File Info, you'll see that the keyword here is moose. And this is done by me. I could put in a description. I could give this a rating. And look at this copyright notice. It's already in there because that was in my camera. So if I send this image to somebody and they're looking through these images and they're wondering, okay, who took this? Well, if you fill this out, you're going to get that information. It's going to pass right through to the editor or to the art director or whoever's processing or working with your image. And with the stock house, that can be really important because they want the information and they don't want to have to go looking for it. And to have it immediately attached is just perfect. I also want to call your attention to one other neat little thing here. If you look at the file name up here in the corner, you'll notice there's a little copyright symbol there now. Can you see it? It's really tiny. Well, when you choose this to be copywritten, the little copyright symbol comes up as part of the file name. That's how you get it there. Next, what I'd like to talk about are some automated things that we can do with this. And if you were to end up doing, let's say, a sequence of images, like these are all of this troll that they have out in the woods, and that's seven images right there. Well, if I shift click on this and get all seven images together, I can now go up to stacks and I can say group as a stack or control G. And what this has just done is it's just put all seven into this nice folder here. And you can step through and see all seven if you want. But sometimes if you're doing an HDR sequence, like here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, well, it's really nice to be able to just kind of tidy things up, if you will, because these are the seven that I would like to stack. And if I go up here to stacks again, as a group as stack, this can make your light table here, if you will, just to be a little more organized. Here's one more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I've just chosen these seven. 
And if I go up to stacks, all I have to do is say group a stack. And now I've got all my HDR stacks all nice and neatly kind of put away. And if you ever want to unstack, all you have to do is click on this, go up to stacks, and then you'll see ungroup from stack. And what that's going to do is just give you however many images that you've stacked together. It'll just bring it back out. So that's just a nice little way to kind of tidy up. Like here, I've got this hummingbird and the flower. If I didn't want to see it three times, I could stack those three. A stack can be any number. It's got to be two images or more. Here's a couple more automated things that we can do. Let's say if I wanted to take this image and maybe this image and maybe this image and just make JPEGs out of these. I find this really useful because if you're going to be creating a slideshow, for instance, or let's say you'd like to send your raw files off just to make prints at Walmart or Walgreens, if you go to Tools and then go down to Photoshop and go to Image Processor, now that's three steps that you have to do. So first is Tools, then you go to Photoshop, then you go to Image Processor. Now this is going to recognize that you've chosen three images from Bridge, and I'd like to save them as a JPEG file. I'd like to convert them to sRGB, so that's the color space that we need for uh, most uh, printers, like Walmart and Walgreens. And now how big do we want this to be? Well, here's the part that we do have to do a little bit of math. So let's say if we wanted to make this fit, oh, like a 5 by 7 well, 7 times 300 is going to be 2100, isn't it? So on the tall side, that's going to be 7 inches tall. The width will not stretch out to that, but it will go proportionately if it's a vertical shot. Or if it's a horizontal shot, it will take this out to 2100, but it won't go over what you've put in. So let's say if we wanted to size these for, say, an 8 by 12. The biggest width, if it were... 10 inches, we know that's going to be 3,000 pixels, right? Because 10 times 300 is 3,000. So 12 times 300 is going to be 3,600, right? So if I put in 3,600 by 3,600, now it's going to adopt whichever one of these that it can such that the other dimension won't exceed that. And I'm going to go ahead and say run, save it as a JPEG. I'm telling it to resize to fit within this box. By the way, I could save it as a PSD file if I were so inclined, and I could change the sizes there. Or I could even save it as a TIFF file. So let's just go ahead and run this. And what this is going to do is it's going to take those three files, and it's going to open it, resize it, attach the color space that you've assigned, and then it's going to save these into a folder that's simply called JPEG because that's what we're doing. So I'm going to come back to Bridge, and now we have a folder that we didn't have before. And if I open this, you'll see that there are three images. And if I look at any of these images, you'll notice now 3600 by 2400. That's an 8 by 12. And also take a notice that this is sRGB, so we've just done the color space conversion. And the file size is certainly a lot smaller at 4 megs than it was when it started. Remember, it was like about 39 meg file. Here's the next one. And here's the last one. So these would be ready to go to Walmart, Walgreens, wherever, and do a print. Now, again, 8 by 12. So you're going to be losing an inch on either side. I'd recommend cropping this 8 by 10. And we know how to do that. So that's, a, I think, a wonderful automated function. What if I wanted to put these into a slideshow? Well, let's just grab three images at random. One, two, and I'll do a vertical just because that's a good, uh, good one to do. All right. So I'll go back to Tools. I go back to Photoshop, and I go back to Image Processor. Now, this is where I'm going to want to say 1920, because remember, high-def TVs unless we're dealing with 4K, are on 1920 wide by 1080 tall. 
This is now going to resize each of these images so that it doesn't exceed these boundaries, and it's going to make sure that at least one of the dimensions, be it horizontal or vertical, exactly meets one of these two. So let's see how it does it. We ready? I'm going to hit run. This is once again going to open up the raw file. If I had done any image editing to that raw file, it's going to apply that, by the way, plus it's tipping it to sRGB, and it's resizing. So that's just been done. If you're ever doing a slideshow, you always want to resize the images because have you ever seen a slideshow where it gets to a certain image, then it kind of chokes? Well, it's because you get this elephant size image that the slideshow is trying to manage and it slows everything down while it's trying to get that image up on the screen and then it's trying to open up the next image all the while trying to deal with transitions and still play music and all this don't do that. By the way, if you have a digital picture frame, find out what the maximum dimensions are for width by height and do the same thing. Now you can get more pictures in there because if you make the images bigger, it's not going to look any better. So look at this. So this image is 1620 by 1080. That certainly fits into the box of high def. Now it's not 1920. That would be nice to have. We'd have to do some cropping to do that, but it's absolutely within the box. Same thing with this one. Absolutely fits the entire screen of your high def TV. Just know that you're going to have pillars on the left and the right, which is okay. And this vertical one, look at this. It's still 1080 tall, so that exactly fits the TV screen format. It's only 720 wide. That's okay because it's not over 1920. So this is a great way to be able to prep images quickly for slideshows, for digital picture frames, to prep them to put it into uh, social media or to make them so they're able to be emailed. I do this all the time whenever I'm scanning slides. When I'm done with these elephant files that are so big, I just downsize them all. And this way people can manage them a little bit easier, share them on social media, put them up on uh, Facebook, send them off to Walmart, Walgreens, make prints. I mean, small prints, obviously. But that's a really wonderful automated function. And again, it's under Tools, Photoshop, and Image Processor. There's a couple more things I'd like to show you that we can easily do in Bridge. Again, it has to do with automating things. Let's say if I wanted to rename all of these files right here, these sailboats, I can go up to Tools and use Batch Rename. And now I can come in here and I can give this a title. So maybe I'll call this sailing dash. Now sequence number, I'm going to start with number one. I only need two digits, but I could have up to six digits. So I'm just going to go with two. Here's what the new file, here's what the current file name is. Here's what the new file name is going to be. Now, if I wanted to, I could even hit plus and then come and say, let's use the preserved file name. So here's file name. It's going to be sailing 01. And then I've got the original number that was in the camera. Now that might be useful if you wanted to send these images off to somebody and say, all right, pick out one of these sailing shots. Well, they could easily look at image number one, two, three, four, what have you, as opposed to having to go look at MG underscore 8246, 8247, 8248, and so forth. So let's just go ahead and say rename to these. And this is going to do this automatically. And I'm renaming the same folder. And there they all are. And if I go down to sailing, here they are, sailing number one, number two, number three. So I could send these off to somebody now. And I could say, all right, pick the sailing shot that you might want for, for your need. And all I need to know is that two-digit number. It makes it so much easier for the recipient to say, hey, Mike, I want to have shot number seven. Or, hey, Mike, I really like this shot for a possible magazine cover because you've got a lot of sky. I'd like number 10. Well, I know exactly where to find that. It's right there. 
So that's a really neat way to be able to go. And by the way, I've preserved this because what if I was out shooting nature and let's say I had a picture of a bird or maybe an animal. Maybe I go to the ranger station and I show them one of these images and he says shot number 8255 is a flowering hibiscus. Well, I can write that number down. Now, when I get back home, I might rename all of them as being maybe the name of the trip or the fact I was in Hawaii or whatever, but I can retain the original name of the file so that I can go back to the notes that I may have made in the field. And now I can actually go in in the metadata, put in what the t proper title is of that bird or plant or whatever, because it's going to exactly match up. See, I don't always want to lose the number that the camera assigns. And by doing it this way, I preserve that. Here's one more case. What if you're doing student photos for a school? Oh my gosh. Can you imagine if you put in the school name dash zero one dash zero two and so forth? If you didn't have this number with every student name that you would be writing this down out in the field, unless you knew all the kids, how would you ever know to find little Johnny versus little Robbie or Kevin or you know whomever? So I find this incredibly useful to be able to include the original file name when you're doing the the tools and batch rename. One more thing I'd like to show you that I do a lot in uh, this application is let's say if I wanted to bring some images up into layers in Photoshop. Now, these probably aren't the best choices, but if I wanted to do that, I could go to Tools, go back to Photoshop, and then I could say load into Photoshop layers. Watch what this does for me. Here's one of the images. And by the way, it's applying the camera raw corrections that were added. Here's the second image. And I think we may have a third image coming up. If I open up layers, oh, here they all are. So look at this. If I shut these off, I could send you one file that's got these three images in it. But the nice thing about this is, let's say if you're doing focus stacking, or let's say if you're going to want it to do uh, something where you wanted to, to align these so that you could cut a hole in one to see through, well, this is a quick way to be able to do that. You can take any number of images and load them into Photoshop as layers. Now, all this time, I've been kind of fluid about moving things around to be able to make this accommodate what I want. I can make this so I've got more images or I can have less images. I can make the images that are in the thumbnails larger or smaller. The fact is, this is all fluid. You can move things around to your personal liking. Once you get everything right the way you like it, what you can do, just like you can do in Photoshop, is go to Window, go to Workspace, and then what you can do is create your own workspace. This is where you could go in here and call it Save as New Workspace. And then you could give it a name. For instance, your name. Now, in this case, I've done this before. If I hit Mike, this brings things back to the way that I like to open this up so I can see things. So you can create your own workspace, just like I say you can do in Photoshop. So if you're sharing a computer with somebody and you get your bridge looking just the way you want it, go up and save that workspace. Now, if somebody else jumps on your computer and they move it all around, you can just go back to what you saved. And you don't have to worry about resizing and reallocating and, and doing all that jazz. Sometimes it's really nice to rate an image. Let's say I like this leaf better than this one and better than this one. Well, a quick way to rate this is to click on the stars. And if I just click on this five stars, maybe this one, and I'll do this one as well. I don't like as much, so I'll give those each three stars. See how I'm doing this? This shell is okay. That one I like a little better, so maybe I'll give this four stars, but maybe this one I'm going to give two stars. 
And this one is, yeah, it's okay. I'll give that one four. Maybe I like that one. That might be a nice one to discuss. Maybe I'll give that four, but maybe I should give this one over here a little more. I'll give this one five. Now, just by doing that, look at my filters over here. I can now click on this and say, okay, here's all the images for which I've felt they're deserving of two stars. Here's all the three-star ones. Here's all the four-star ones. And here are the ones that I like a whole lot. Right there. What a quick way to sort. So you can quickly get to these are the, the ones that you really like. Now, again, depending upon your camera, you can probably rate right in the camera. Most Canon cameras have the ability to for you to add stars all the way up to five stars after you've taken the picture, which is, and it's easy. You just poke the rate button. You poke it twice and you get two stars. You poke it four times, you get four stars and so forth. So this is a great way to be able to come back and say, okay, which one did I feel I really liked while I was out in the field? Now you can do the same thing in here. Here's one other thing that we've got as another way to do sorting. Let's say if I really like this image, if I hit control and the number six, I can put a red bar there. Or if I do control and number seven goes to yellow, control number eight, green, control and number nine is uh, going to be blue. And uh, control and zero removes all the stars. So I can do this by color coding. So maybe these two I will give a control seven to. Maybe this one and this one, I'll just do a control eight just for the heck of it. Now, under the sorting, look at this. I can come over here under labels, and here's everything I gave a yellow to. Here's everything I gave a green to. Here's everything I gave a blue to. Now, these say review, approved, second. You can make it whatever you want. And I'll sometimes just go and say, okay, as I'm quickly looking through an image field of images, I'll go and do like these red bars. Just say, okay, I like that one, I like that one, I like that one. Just a real quick first course go through. Now I can go back very quickly and say, okay, these are all the ones that caught my eye. Now I'm going to do more with those. It's just a really quick way to go in and say, yeah, I like this, or no, yes, no, whatever. And by the way, if you sort these this way, look at this. If I go to these, all these green ones, you know, I can do a control A and I could go and resize these. I can make all the green ones, for instance, would be the ones I might put into a slideshow, whereas all the red ones might be ones that are going to be going into print. You can make that whatever you wish. So there's some neat options. And again, all courtesy of Bridge. Now, if I look at my list here of different kinds of files, you notice I've got DNG files, I've got camera raw files, of course I've got folders, I've got a Photoshop file, and I've got some JPEG files. How does this program know what to open different files with? Well, the answer to that is under File Associations. If I go to Edit and then go to Preferences, you'll see that one of the options in here is called file type associations. About every file has a dot something. So for instance, camera raw files from a Canon are gonna be a dot CR2, or in the newer cameras, a dot CR3. Well, this is telling me that this is going to open Adobe Photoshop 2023, version 24, to view or to edit those files. If I were to step through here, you see most everything is going to be this, but there are some others. For instance, a video flash player, it knows to open up the VLC media player that I have. And if you should ever run into a situation where, like here's HTML, well, it knows to open up Internet Explorer. If you ever run into a situation where you go to click on a file, but it's not opening the right program, you could actually browse and you could change this. This is the first place that I go to look to see if maybe something isn't right. Now, if you did the update, but maybe you didn't update Bridge, it's very possible that 
your old bridge might be pointing to an older version of Photoshop. And every time you go to open something, they'll be in conflict because it's trying to open up the older version, but maybe, hopefully, you've deleted that and you're looking at the new version. So this is where you'd want to go, just to confirm, if you ever run into that situation. Right here, PDF documents. It's going to open up Acrobat. I usually don't want that to happen. I usually want it to open up Adobe Photoshop, so I could change that. And what I would do is come over here and just choose Adobe Photoshop. Now if I ever open up a PDF file, it's going to open it up in Photoshop. It's that easy. So there's another way to create a contact sheet that I think might be a little easier, actually. So I'm just going to choose a number of images here. In fact, I'm going to choose 12 images. And now if I go up to Tools and go to Photoshop and go to Contact Sheet, this is going to bring up this page where I can put in what I want the width to be, the height to be, resolution, the color profile. I do want to flatten all the files. I've got 12 files selected. I know I need to have three by four columns to fill the page, right? So I'll have three columns across with four rows. And I'll say OK. And what this is going to do is create the sheet. And then it's going to open each file. It's going to process that file based upon whatever was done for the camera raw. It could be any file type. It could be a TIFF, a bitmap, a JPEG, uh, CR2, CR3, whatever. It's just going to go and bring them all, funnel them all, and it's going to resize them and then put them all up onto a single sheet. Now, I've chosen 12 images, so this is taking a little bit of time. And there is the end result. And now I've got the file name underneath, and this whole image is 8 by 10. So again, if we go look at this in inches, 10 inches wide by 8 inches tall, I can send that off and make a 8 by 10 print. And there's a quick way to send out your work to somebody to say, hey, here's what I do. You could also do this electronically. And by the way, the quality of this is pretty doggone good. If I just take and zoom in, can I clearly see that that's a leaf? Yeah. Gee, if I'd like to buy that image, I'm going to go and ask the maker for 8264. Now, of course, if I'd renamed this, I can make this a whole lot easier for the person to say, oh, yeah, picture number one. But the point is, here's a quick way to make a contact sheet using Bridge. Just a couple more things to talk about here, and then that's really going to be about it uh, for what I use uh, Bridge for. Uh, we do have uh, the ability to create a new folder if you wanted to do it this way, or you can come down and just in between the images, you can right-click and create a new folder as well. If you wanted to get rid of an image, you can go up and use the trash can and throw it away. So that's just really a quick overview of Adobe Bridge. There is a lot to it, but it's fun to poke around. And once you get used to it, I think you're going to like it a lot. And the great thing about Adobe Bridge is it's free. Adobe doesn't actually charge for Bridge. You can have anybody download this. And it's a really great way to browse the media and image files that you might have on your hard drive. So there's a quick walk through Adobe Bridge and some of the functions that I use a lot. And I think that once you get it installed and once you get using it, you will like it as well. Thanks again for joining me for another Friday Night Photoshop.